Bill Sinkford. I'm privileged to serve as the senior minister here at First Unitarian, and we are just delighted to present the Sewell Speaking of Justice Lecture this evening. I want to tell you that the Sewell Lecture was created to honor the ministry of my predecessor and our minister emerita, Dr. Marilyn Sewell, in recognition of her 17-year ministry here at this church and her provision of a voice for justice both here in Portland, in this nation, and beyond. <laughs> Our lecturer tonight is Tom Hartman, and Tom needs very little introduction to most of you. He is a nationally and internationally syndicated progressive talk show host on radio and television and on the internet. He is one of the most widely heard progressive voice voices in the United States today. He's also the author of more than, I think it's 20 books on subjects ranging from the Federalist Papers, climate change and electronic vote rigging to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Whoever said there were no more Renaissance women and men obviously did not know Tom Hartman. Bill McKibben writes of Tom, he has been one of the very few voices constantly willing to tell the truth. Rank him right up there with John Stewart, Bill Moyers, and Paul Krugman for having the sheer persistent courage of his convictions. Tom's subject tonight, amen. Tom's subject tonight is passing the 28th Amendment, creating a people's democracy and ending corporate dominance. Tom, we are blessed by your presence here among us. Please join me in welcoming Tom Hartman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How did it happen that the Supreme Court would have even been in a position, even though they didn't say corporations are persons then, they have 38 times since then. Actually, it's, it's now 40 times. Uh, it was 38 times when I wrote Unequal Protection. Um, how do they even have that power? And what is the impact of this? When this country was founded, that when this republic was founded, that it was founded as a constitutionally limited, in other words, the power of government were limited by the Constitution, constitutionally limited, representative, we hire representatives, it's not like the old Greek polis where everybody, you know, 6,100 people had to show up to make a decision. Um, it's, it's not, quote, mob rule. Um, so it's constitutionally limited, representative, democratic, we have 51% wins, so majority rules, republic, a nation of laws with the Constitution. We tell ourselves that. I'm here to tell you tonight that that's not the case. And it's not these throwaway lines like, oh, we live in a kleptocracy, or we live in an oligarchy, or we live in a, you know, something like that. We actually are living in a constitutional monarchy. Now, uh, you know, a constitutional monarchy like the United Kingdom, like Holland, like Belgium, you know, you, you have a monarch who has the power to dissolve parliament or override the laws passed by parliament or by the prime minister. This was not the intent of the founders. This was not the intent of the founders. And while today, when I go into law schools and talk about uh, Citizens United and, and, and all this kind of stuff, and I say, you know, how many of you know that, or how many of you believe that corporations should, you know, are people, or that even how many of you know that the, that the head note in, in, in Santa Clara County is wrong, Every, you know, everybody's figured that out. When I ask the question, how many of you understand what judicial review is and believe that it's part of our Constitution? Judicial review is the doctrine that the Supreme Court can strike down laws passed by Congress and signed by the President. Ask this question in a law school today. How many of you believe that judicial review is in the Constitution? Everybody's going to raise their hand. And this is 
the core of how we got here. The founders never intended, the framers never intended, and a functioning democracy does not have an unelected monarchy that sits for life, that has such arrogance and power that they will not even allow themselves to be recorded or photographed, and overthrows, overturns, or creates out of whole cloth laws that, overturns laws that are passed by Congress or creates doctrines that were not addressed by Congress. That happens in constitutional monarchies, and frankly, very rarely in them. But we have a constitutional monarchy in the United States, and the monarchs are nine people in the Supreme Court who show up in these black robes and have claimed for themselves the power to strike down the laws passed by our representatives at our request that we have stated this. Because it was judicial review, by the way, that got us Citizens United, that got us, Mar that got us uh, um, First National Bank versus Pilate, which preceded Citizens United. It was, the, it was the case that said that corporations have personhood status and they can engage in politics. It got us you know, Buckley versus Vallejo, which said that money is the equivalent of speech functionally. And these kind of all came together in Citizens United. It was judicial review over and over and over again, this, this idea of, of taking on, using, interpreting the Constitution, interpreting laws in the context of the Constitution. So where, so where did this bizarre notion come from that the Supreme Court can like just one day come up and say, hey, you know, corporations are people and money is speech. It has never been passed. It has never been proposed. It's never been debated. I mean, this is supposed to be a democracy, right? You'd think. So here's, here's how it happened. From 1789, when the Constitution was ratified and we became a republic, and uh, George Washington was elected the first president by unanimous consent of the Constitutional Convention. From 1789 and during the Washington administration until 1803, this is a generation, the, the Supreme Court never once ruled on the constitutionality of anything. They didn't have the power. They knew they didn't have the power. Didn't even occur to them. They were deciding cases about dogs and chickens, you know, pretty much. And, and of course, their original jurisdiction, you know, if a state, if two states were getting in a, in a pissing war about, you know, whiskey taxes or something, they'd figure that out. You know, that, that was their job. Nobody had a complaint about that. So, so anyhow, what happened is the election of 1800 happened, and, and um, there had been a law passed the year before that said that if the president appointed somebody to be a, 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 a judge or a marshal or, or you know, some federal position and failed to deliver the papers to them, uh, they, they, were still, they were still a federal judge. In, in other words, if they, were, if they didn't go through an investiture procedure or a ceremony or they didn't get the, the actual paper, but, but it had been signed, that they were still a judge. It was called the Judicial Act of 1798, I think. And on his way out, as John Adams was leaving, he did two things to kick Thomas Jefferson in the teeth as hard as he could because these guys hated each other at that time. The first was he put Jefferson's third cousin and most bitter political enemy on earth as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall who then proceeded to sit on the Supreme Court for another 34 years. And the second thing he did was he created 20, 30, some odd, I don't forget the exact number, brand new federal judgeships and, and positions, various judiciary positions, and Article III positions, and, and had his Secretary of State run around and pass out the papers to all these people. So when Jefferson came in, there was five or six of these that hadn't been delivered, and one of them was, uh, and James Madison, was the Secretary of State, and, one of, and they were on Madison's desk. 
And Jefferson said to Madison, don't deliver those papers. We're not going to let these, you know, <laughs> we're not going to let Adams do any more damage to us, because Adams basically had packed the federal courts. And one of the guys who had gotten an appointment was a fellow by the name of Marbury. And he was pretty upset that he was not getting his job. And so he sued. And it went through a couple, it went through an appeals court, federal appeals court, and then it went before the United States Supreme Court in 1803. And the case was called Marbury versus Madison. Marbury was the guy who thought he should get the judgeship, even though he didn't get the paperwork. Madison was the Secretary of, the st of State who was supposed to deliver it to him, or, and didn't. In that case, Justice Marshall ruled in favor of the Jefferson administration, saying that Marbury didn't get his judgeship because the papers hadn't been delivered and struck down the Federal Judiciary Act of 1798. In other words, they actually, it was the first exercise of judicial review. Now, this put Thomas Jefferson in this horrible position because he couldn't appeal a decision that he had just won. And yet he thought it was insane that the Supreme Court should have the power to strike down a law that had been passed by Congress. Here is what he said. If this opinion be sound, then indeed is our Constitution a complete felo de so, which is Latin for suicide pact. <laughs> for intending to establish three departments, coordinate and independent, that they might check and balance one another, it has given, this decision, Marbury versus Madison, it has given, according to this opinion, to one of them alone, the Constitution on this hypothesis is a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please. It's Thomas Jefferson, 1803, going bonkers about, about uh, judicial review. He goes on to say, it should be remembered as an axiom of eternal truth in politics, that whenever power in any government is independent, it is absolute also. He's talking about the Supreme Court. In theory only at first, while the spirit of the people is up, he's talking about his own time. You know, people are looking around going, why are you so upset? I mean, it was just Mr. Marbury didn't get his job. Come on, get over it, Thomas. In theory only at first, while well, the spirit of the people is up, but in practice, as fast as that relaxes. Independence can be trusted nowhere but with the people in mass. They are inherently independent of all but moral law. My construction of the Constitution, that this is where, you know, I, I said, if somebody asked Jefferson, you know, okay, if the Supreme Court doesn't determine what the Constitution means, who does, right? My construction of the Constitution is very different. It is that each department is truly independent of the others and has an equal right to decide for itself what is the meaning of the Constitution in the cases submitted to its action, and especially where it is to act ultimately and without appeal. In other words, to reduce that to contemporary English, if Congress passes a law that violates the Constitution, we're the ones who correct that by throwing the bums out in the next election. If the president signs a law that's contrary to the Constitution, we're the ones who correct that by throwing the bum out in the next election. Jefferson then continues after this, after this speech about how independent power becomes absolute power, the people will ignore it when their spirit is up, when the people have a lot of juice going, but as soon as the people fall asleep, that independent power, that absolute power is going to raise its ugly head and turn your democracy into a monarchy. He says, and I quote, 
A judiciary, and this is still about the Marbury case. This is all one long quote. A judiciary independent of a king or executive alone is a good thing. But independent of the will of the nation is a solecism. Nice 18th century word for a blunder, a stupid thing, a horrible error, an unbelievably hor horrible error, at least in a Republican government, small r, end of quote. So this is how you know, people, people uh, hear about the, uh, the court packing scheme that that uh, FDR was involved in in 1937. And 19, for, you know, the New Deal really started in 1933, and FDR was you know, things like you know, minimum wage laws and, and unemployment insurance and, and uh, you know, all, all this kind of cool stuff. And um, the Supreme Court just started knocking it down, as they had been since, I mean, they, they knocked down the, you know, so that uh, the minimum age to work, it, uh, you had to be 12 years old to work, they knocked that down in like 1910 or 1911 or something like that. And, and finally, uh, FDR just got so PO'd about the whole thing in 1937 that he said, okay, that's it. Article three, section two of the Constitution says Congress can regulate the Supreme Court. Here's how we're gonna regulate the Supreme Court. We're gonna say there's nine guys on the Supreme Court, that's fine. At the time, by the way, four of them were over 70. Anybody who's on the Supreme Court who's over 70 becomes a justice emeritus and in aggregate, all of the 70 plus year olds have one vote. <laughs> to fill in the remaining votes, we'll put some more people on the bench. So he would have added three people to the bench. Thus, court packing. This is totally legal. And there have been several books written just about that one little six month window in time in American history. And there's a general agreement that actually if FDR had pushed he probably would have got it passed. The American people were with him. They were so pissed off at the Supreme Court. They wanted the New Deal. And in 37, all of a sudden, halfway into FDR trying to get this through Congress, and Congress actually debating it, because they had the power to, because it's right there in the Constitution. Halfway through this, the Supreme Court suddenly says, oh yeah, oh, Social Security, totally constitutional. And, you know, not just Social Security, minimum wage, uh, uh, minimum work week, uh, the 50-hour work week was another one that they had knocked down. There, were several, there was a bunch of them. I forget the whole list, but there was a whole bunch of them. They all reversed themselves in 19... And not a single person had changed on the court. It's just that they kind of got the fear of God put into them. And they, and they also might have bothered to read the Constitution. There are, there are people who are suggesting that the solution to our Supreme Court having invented a policy out of thin air. Now, it took a long time for it to actually happen. And this, you know, I'm, I'm sure David Cobb and the Wilf people and the Move to Amend people, they've got great educational material. There's enormous history here. It's in my book, it's in other books. Uh, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom has this like 20 foot long scroll of all the Supreme Court decisions that contributed to this, starting in 1815 with the Dartmouth case, the first time that a foreign corporation was given standing before the United States Supreme Court as a person, um, but not constitutional rights, but at least standing. I mean, you know, it was like the, the camel's nose under the tent, uh, Jefferson's phrase, you know, the, the, the spirit of the people is no longer up, as it were. Jefferson was so upset about Marbury versus Madison. The American people were so upset about Marbury versus Madison. The blowback against the Supreme Court in 1803 with Marbury versus Madison was so great, even though Jefferson could do nothing about it because you can't appeal a case you just won. <laughs> and he couldn't get Congress to pass a law saying, hey, wait a minute, let's, you know, because it's already in the Constitution that the court waited two generations before they again decided something based on the Constitution, before they engaged in judicial review. It was in 1856. Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was a fellow by the name of Roger Taney. 
And there was this horrible problem in the United States of slavery not being over, even though the Constitution said that in 1808 the slave importation would be ended and the general consensus was within a generation slavery would be over. It didn't happen. John Quincy Adams, after he, was, after he left the White House, after he left uh, his presidency, went back to the House of Representatives just to fight against slavery, ran for the House of Representatives. You know, it was a big deal. So in 1856, Roger Taney says, well, okay, we'll solve this problem once and for all. We're the friggin' Supreme Court after all. We got the power. We'll make a decision based on the Constitution. We will determine that the Constitution says that people of color are actually property. The, the decision was Dred Scott. That worked out real well, right? <laughs> Instant civil war. That was the second time that, the, that the, the court had used judicial review. Three or four generations before that, it was dogs and chickens. And then what do we get? The Civil War. And now we've got a Supreme Court that doesn't do anything except decide cases based on constitutionality, which they have no authority to do. They are making law every single day, and they're doing it wrong. This is the job of Congress. It's right there in the Constitution. And it's the job of the president, if he thinks it's wrong, to veto it or to sign it if he thinks it's right, and then, and then to, to execute it. So anyhow, the reason, the reason I'm telling you all this backstory is because there are, are a couple of suggestions about what should we do about Citizens United. One of those suggestions is Let's just wait until one of these old right-wingers on the court croaks and hope that Obama or Hillary Clinton or somebody, some, some decent Democrat is in the White House and, and, or retires. I mean, we, we don't have to wish death on anybody. Sandra Day O'Connor retired. You know, it's a, I'm, not wishing, I, I'm not wishing death on anybody. But basically, let's just wait until the composition of the court changes. The court will revisit Citizens United. They'll tweak it and recalibrate it and everything will be fine. Bull. This is not the solution. Yes, one of the most important things that a president does in his appointing Supreme Court justices, why? Because we live in a constitutional monarchy. I mean, we have to understand this. This is a constitutional monarchy, and the monarchs are appointed by the president. And the president is the only guy that we get to elect. And that's why the presidential elections, frankly, are so much more important than anybody realizes. Because those five crazies on the Supreme Court, every single one of them was put there by a Republican. So anyhow, there are people who are suggesting that, that, the, this, that a solution is to simply wait for the composition of the court to change. And I say no, because what will happen is you'll get a recalibration. You'll get a slight adjustment. But it leaves intact the idea that corporations have rights under the 14th Amendment, and it leaves intact the idea that money is somehow speech. And as I said when I first started, these are not just corrupting our politics. They're filling our foods with genetically modified organisms and pesticides. They're filling our air with poisons. They're filling our bodies with carcinogens. They're, they're devastating our children's neurological systems so that we're seeing an epidemic of, 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 every, of birth defects and, and, quote, neurological disorders. They are, they're, they're building a permanent war machine and now a permanent national security state. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Because they have, because these corporations claim the power of persons to lobby their members of, their members of Congress. The Supreme Court's not going to blow that up. So that's one solution that's proposed. And I say, you know, that's all nice and good. And people say, just wait for the Supreme Court to change. Not going to be enough. So beware of politicians who are proposing half measures that sound good. Oh, yeah, we got to roll back citizens of the United States. Terrible thing. Let's just tweak it a little bit by saying we can regulate money in politics. But what's that going to do about Monsanto standing in court where they're claiming the right to not tell you what's in, their, in, your, pro, in your food? Nothing. We need, we need instead to have a clean, clear, explicit, 
unambiguous amendment to the United States Constitution, and unfortunately we have to do it this way, because ever since 1803, we have, we have had this constitutional monarchy just as Thomas Jefferson predicted. The judiciary has, or the Constitution has become a thing of wax in the hands of, of the judiciary to be molded as it pleases. We don't need the Supreme Court. You know, forget this stuff about, you know, people say, oh, no, you've got to have judicial review. Otherwise, you know, we'd still have segregation and, and, and abortion would be illegal everywhere. No, sorry. Actually, I think that because it was the Supreme Court that decided Roe v. Wade, rather than legislatures across the United States, where the people spoke clearly and unambiguously, and the decision and the debate was put to bed because the people spoke, but instead because it was nine guys, and at that time it was nine men, in, in the Supreme Court all saying, oh, well, this is the way it is, it's still a point of contention. Right? This is, this, if, if anything, if, and, and, and the whole impeach your old Warren, you know, Daddy Coke, Fred Coke, with his impeach your old Warren signs all over the country. Those of you old enough to remember those in the 50s and 60s, John Birch Society, is because of, you know, Brown v. Board, 1954. Um, that I would, I would submit to you that the Supreme Court, with judicial review, has virtually never done this country any favors. From the second time it was used by Roger Taney in 1856 in Dred Scott to last week. There's just no need for it. As Thomas Jefferson said, let the people be the arbiters of what is the Constitution. So in summary, we need an unambiguous amendment to the Constitution that says to the Supreme Court, hey, you can't mess with this. This is the Constitution. You can't interpret this because we're going to say it in a way that you can't misunderstand, misrepresent, or pretend is not there, that number one, corporations are not persons, whether they're for profit or not profit. In fact, no business entity, no artificial entity, limited liability partnerships, uh, LLCs, uh, some brand new thing that's been invented, you know, two weeks from now by some slick lawyer, none of it. The only people who are people are people, right? Number one. And number two, that says that this is not speech. I mean, if this was speech, I could sit up here and just go. <laughs> I, don't I don't see it happening. Money is not speech. And we just need to unambiguously say, Money is not speech and may be regulated for any purpose, including political purposes. I mean, especially we want to do it for political purposes, but really for any purpose. Money can be regulated because it is property. If we say those two things, and we have to have both of them, we can have a constitutionally limited democratic uh, republic, representative democratic republic, and our nation could once again become a democracy instead of a corrupted constitutional monarchy. Thank you. We've been watching video clips of Tom Hartman's recent lecture here in Portland, Oregon at the Free Unitarian Church. His topic was movement to pass the 28th Amendment, corporations are not people, money is not speech. If you agree that we should pass a 28th Constitutional Amendment stating those sentiments, please visit the website movetoamend.org and sign the petition. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation and that you'll join us again next week. Bye.